Boudicca Light. A search for Boudicca finds its author, but not the Queen of the Iceni. Duncan McKay's Echo Lands is difficult to summarize. The subtitle doesn't really do it. The book is less about finding Boudicca and more an exploration of the layers of material her escapades left behind, especially in Colchester. Echo Lands is much more apt. The places that McKay visits, Travis's and dwells in are vividly described as a conscious attempt to revive the past as lived experience. Such an endeavor is to be applauded, and there are real moments of joy and insight. While we do spend a lot of time in East Anglia, we also journey from the banks of the Thames in London to Anglesey and Lincolnshire. We are on a trek that shadows Boudicca, her Britons and the Romans who tried to stop their rebellion. Rather than the outdoorsy travelogue one might expect, much of the action, so to speak, takes place in museums. Colchester is particularly rich in finds related to the Boudican Rebellion and Mackay makes the most of them. Particularly striking is the bed found in Lion Walk, burnt nearly to cinders during the city's destruction, it somehow survived in relatively recognizable form as two rectangular couches or mattresses. Pompeii could not give us anything more captivating than this battered, aged scrap of soft furnishing, which may or may not have been the spot some poor Romans spent their last night on earth. Similarly, the Temple of Claudius, built at some point between Ad 49 and 60, and later incorporated by the Normans into Colchester Castle. McKay's speculation that many of Camulodunum's citizens would have fled to the temple to escape in vain the wrath of the Britons, is conjured in detail. Such is his description that the reader has no trouble recreating the image of it, its comparators are the US Supreme Court building, or the Royal Exchange at Bank. With such visions in mind, the conflagration that consumed the temple burns all the more brightly down the ages. Imagination, as McKay makes clear, is vital to historical understanding, this should be shouted from every ivory-towered rooftop. So far, all to the good. Yet the book has numerous frustrations. The first of these could be dismissed as special pleading, given that I have written a book about Boudicca that McKay does not cite. But it is unclear what literature McKay is contributing to or why he has decided to read what he's read, and not read what he has not read. He states that he wants to achieve a sense of immediacy between the ancient past and the present, akin to that which can be found through film, a sense of the past happening before our eyes. But, no pun intended, this is a rather limited lens. Dramatists have been replaying the past for centuries. One need only look to the 20th century historical pageant movement, which McKay only briefly alludes to in the Colchester context, to see that playing with the elasticity of time is part of Boudicca's posthumous story. Despite ostensibly being her book, there are few new insights about Boudicca herself, or about ancient Britain, or about Boudicca's cultural afterlife. McKay's imagined scenarios about what may or may not have happened in any given place during her rebellion are arresting and form some of the book's best material, but are speculative. References to recent archaeology far outweigh any appeals to history or literary studies, although it is those areas, and arguably, anthropology, not archaeology, that would provide a more satisfying context. Even a dip into the writing of R. G. Collingwood, whose work on Roman Britain will surely be familiar to McKay, might have given depth to what can, at times, feel like a superficial narrative. One might also wonder about McKay's geographical focus. Of course Boudicca's connection with Colchester is hugely significant, but we spend an awful lot of time there that we don't spend in the other two places indelibly marked by Boudicca's rebellion, London and St. Albans. According to the biographical blurb, McKay lives in Norfolk, so there is an element of proximity and convenience that is rather too obvious. If one really wanted to travel with Boudicca, it would mean going deeper and further than McKay goes. Tacitus Annals is his primary classical source, 
along with the archaeological evidence, and this is all very good and sensible. But part of the durability of the Boudicca tradition lies in its potential for reimagining and reinterpretation for reasons other than the weight of evidence. See, for example, Boudicca's significance in Wales, where she is Bud Dug, or Victoria. At least one Welsh antiquary did all he could to place her death in Flintshire. We lose some wonder and nuance in this retelling, and even more so as it is further refracted through the most limiting lens of all, the self. This is the most frustrating aspect of the book. Given that the material can lack definitive shape, one could ask for more authorial intervention on substantive points. Instead, what we get is authorial intervention in the form of a continuous subplot about the author's life, family, past, likes, dislikes. This may be a matter of style publishers think readers respond well to such things. Certainly, there is a rich vein of travel writing that follows authorial self-discovery. But, for this reader at least, that style feels overbearing. I know what the author's dog is called, about his wife, his child, I know when his mother died. If he told me what football team he supports, I missed it. I am still a little confused about the book's point, but I have learned quite a lot about Duncan McKay. Do we need more books about Boudicca? We do. Did we need this book? Probably in some form, but it could have been so much more than what it is. And so much less, 